Thank you for uh, joining us after uh, our first break. Um, we've got a very exciting panel, um, which is going to be with only myself and Christoph being in person, and the rest of our panelists will be joining us uh, virtually. So uh, the panel title is Taking Cautious Risk. Does commercialization of space activities allow for greater risk management in space? Uh, I'll be your uh, panel chair. Uh, for that particular session, and uh, we've got uh, uh, three very well-known names within the space industry joining us uh, uh, from uh, three locations around the world. Uh, so uh, I'll take a seat. Uh, I will have, first of all, uh, Dr. Lamont Colucci introduce uh, himself to, to our audience, and then we'll move on from there. Dr. Colucci? Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so my name is Lamont Colucci, and I'm a professor of political science at Concordia University and the CEO and co-founder of an organization called Space Fund Intelligence, which is an attempt to bring together all aspects of space, uh, whether it be military science, uh, security, medicine, uh, venture capital into kind of one roof uh, of experts. And my particular interest is the link between uh, geopolitics and astropolitics. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Colucci. And then uh, moving on from there, uh, maybe we can have uh, Christoph to oh. do a quick introduction. Yes. Uh, good morning. My name is Dr. Christoph Beischel. I'm a research fellow at the London Institute of Space Policy and Law. We are a think tank based here in London. We do, on the educational side, provide services such as uh, specialized courses for space sector professionals who want to learn more about policy and law. And we, on the research end, we do a lot of space policy and law topics. In recent time, we have particularly focused on the Asian region, European region, space safety, security, and space terminology. Thank you. And then moving on from there, uh, Brian Mishima Baker. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Mishima Baker. Uh, you may notice that I'm the, the one exception on the panel. I am a, a mere attorney as opposed to a, a doctor next to his name, so take that for what it's worth. Uh, uh, I have been practicing law for about 10 years and currently uh, have the pleasure of serving in the United States Air Force. Um, but I'm also the legal advisor to the Space Propulsion Synergy team. I've been an active member of the American Bar Association panel on space law since uh, around 2013. Uh, and my most recent publications have mostly focused on the legal regime uh, in space, particularly the lunar region, and um, looking at where that regime uh, is lacking in the requirements that particularly commercialization of space is going to require in the near future. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion today. Uh, important as part of my job for me to mention, uh, all of my comments that I make uh, during our discussion here today are, are my own thoughts and opinions and don't necessarily reflect the, the thoughts or opinions or stances of uh, the United States, United States government, or any other body or agency. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Matthias Widmar. Hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I'm Matt Widmar. I'm a lecturer in engineering management um, at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. Uh, but I'm also the chairman and policy lead for a group called Gateway Earth Development Group, uh, proposing a um, modular space access architecture through geostationary orbit. Um, as well as being the co-founder of a biotech company called Algacraft, uh, which is proposing to grow food in space for long-duration spaceflight missions. Uh, so across those things, I think um, we, we're looking at various aspects of how risks in space um, actually affect both the space exploration as well as the introduction of infrastructure into space. Um, and I've also wrote a very whimsical paper uh, looking at some of the ways in which risk is being discussed uh, by some of the proponents of commercial space flight. Thank you. And um, myself will go last. So uh, my name is Timo Karakashev. I am the founder and CEO of Cosmonauts. Cosmonauts is a growth, business growth support advisory firm based in London. We specialize in 
direct commercialization, direct product commercialization of uh, enterprise innovation products. And we also support companies with fundraising. Um, we're active in the fields of uh, legal and intellectual property innovation. About two years ago, we've also entered the space innovation and the agri-tech sectors too. So um, with that in mind, I will move on to our first question on our panel. So what are the risks associated with commercialization? We're touching on cybersecurity, perhaps space debris. Maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Colucci on, on that one. What are the risks associated with commercialization, Dr. Colucci? Well, I think from, from my perspective, uh, <clears throat> looking at it from this issue of international relations, international security, <clears throat> the risk of space commercialization and, and new space, and however you want to use the term, really boils down to what order system will be created out there. Um, no human endeavor like this is going to exist in a vacuum. And so the question for multiple, whether it be countries and players, will be what kind of security exists out there to maintain this wonderful opportunity for a new economic revolution. So from the perspective, I think, of many of us uh, that are dealing in and out of the US government and the issue surrounding Space Force is that one of the functions of Space Force with its allied partners is going to be trying to set that secure term, that secure environment. It's going to be very difficult for companies to talk about enforcing contracts and investment and protection of private property, whether it be a physical or intellectual, unless there is some type of rules-based system that is protected by uh, some type of whatever you wish to call it, a space constabulary or whatever you want to call it. And, and so we, many people that I talk to in the, in the new space realm don't seem to be concerned enough, I think, about that rules-based system that needs to be there first. And, 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 and so for the first risk I would mention is the risk that there are bad actors out there, be they non-state actors or national actors, that will attempt to abuse and exploit whatever system is created. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, from, from a legislation standpoint, uh, Brian, how much responsibility should the state take of those private actors uh, out there in space? So it, it's an interesting question. Um, so it, famously in the Outer Space Treaty in Articles 6 and 7, um, which has been widely adopted by certainly uh, um, all of the uh, spacefaring nations and many, many others, uh, it, it's pretty well laid out that uh, it, at least one nation is supposed to have full responsibility over all activities in space. And then, of course, in Article 7, it says that potentially several different countries should could have liability over uh, actions in space, even the actions of uh, private individuals and corporations as they're doing things in space. So um, it, it, to answer the question, how much, you know, it, how much responsibility does the state have? Well, according to international legal regime, uh, they have total responsibility over what happens. Uh, I think one of the major questions that exists in um, in the world today is exactly interpreting what does that mean. Uh, one potential interpretation of that responsibility could suggest that therefore every single action taken in space. Uh, needs to have some sort of licensure uh, by, by the launching state or whatever uh, uh, state has responsibility or, over the actions in space. And that could be taken to an extreme level of do you need a license to both take toothpaste into space as well as to open the toothpaste, a separate license for putting the toothpaste on the toothbrush. It, it, you know, it can get to quite an extreme level. Um, but uh, another extreme uh, interpretation could mean that you only need licensure or permission from the state for certain actions or, or even don't need licensure, but if it should cause harm to another actor, that, that the state ultimately holds liability for those actions. 
Um, so uh, ultimately, I think the answer to those questions is going to come down to, as was uh, uh, talked about by uh, Dr. Colucci, was uh, it, it'll look into what the norms uh, of state actors or what the norms of actors in space ultimately become. And I think other people will follow suit uh, in those actions. And Christoph, we touched on that um, during our prep talk last, last week, but when it comes to those norms, you know, from, from your stand, standpoint, you know, what should be the formula of, of, of them being put forward, the formula of the norms, you know, who should be the one responsible for them, um, perhaps a collective of, of states? Well, as has been said, the ultimate responsibility li relies with the specific state. So if we're talking about international norms, the responsibility is with the with all states. They have to come together to form a, an agreement, as they have done with the Outer Space Treaty that has been uh, set, created in '67. And if we are talking about something that the space, the commercial space industry might be more interested in right now, it's for example the creation of a space traffic management regime uh, that spans the globe and which, al which creates a system that enforces responsible behavior of all actors in space from a safety perspective, from a security perspective. If we are talking then about responsibility on the domestic end for creating some norms, it's again the state However, on the domestic end, it's a lot easier for companies to also influence what states set up by lobbying. And I just want to add, lobbying is not, it's not a negative term. It is just created as such in the media. <laughs> that there is a need for commercial entities to go to government and explain to them what they're doing because they can only regulate things they understand. I mean, with that in mind, would increased commercialization then lead to further regulations and therefore greater risk management? Maybe your point of view, Dr. Widmar? Yeah, um, I think the, 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 there's two answers to that. One is without doubt, uh, but the, the other thing I think is it refers to the, the points made by um, Dr. Colucci and, 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 and Mishima Baker because um, th there is a, there's now a question, emerging question around this idea as to if there is need to police those regula regulations, how do we go about doing that? And there's this you know, space force and other proposals being put forward. And, and here I think we have to be a little bit careful. I think there's a, there's a long standing tradition in, in, in the UK where we try to do policing by consent. And that is perhaps somewhat different to, to how policing of this sort of regulation is done. We have a bit of an issue with uh, the feet from uh, Dr. Vidmar. Um, we'll definitely get him back to continue his, his talk. But in the meantime, I, I would like to address a, a question to uh, Dr. Colucci. Um, does the current state of the space industry present an opportunity for the West and the East to work together on establish, establishing better risk management norms? Well, I guess that depends on the East. Um, and I assume by the East you're, you're primarily talking about China, I mean, unless you're referring to some other power of the East. But, uh, um, you know, I, I, mean, I mean, the norms that, that a country like China will follow will be the norms that they find in their uh, self-interest. And, um, you know, I, I talk a lot about templates. So, you know, you can, we don't know how a national actor will act in space um, very much because we don't have the history behind it. So what do we use? We use what they've been doing on Earth. And so if you look at recent actions by the Chinese state in the South China Sea or against Taiwan, uh, or against the Uyghurs, or against their own people, or, or against the Christian community there, whatever, 
whatever issue you'd like, it's, it's pretty much all horrific. Um, it's all on the negative side. It's all on the dark side. You know, we, you know, we'd add climate to that. We could add environment to that. So, so there, there's simply no indication that China will be a responsible actor in space. And in, in relation to that, we have Chinese pronouncements about what they will do in space. In a very transparent way, China is declaring itself to be the desired sovereign over cislunar space. So if, if, if both history is a guide and current Chinese pronouncements are a guide, then, then it's, it's, it's to, to say it's a long shot that they'll be a responsible actor in space uh, is a complete understatement. Um, now, when, when self-interest merges with norms of behavior, whether we international law, space law, which eventually develops, then sure. And, and one of those might be, uh, as, as mentioned, traffic management or debris management, because there's a self-interest there that can be negotiated and dealt with. But if we're talking about other areas, then I think it's extremely doubtful that there's going to be a meeting of the minds in a positive way. Uh, I've got a question for you, Christoph. Um, what are the key differences between the West and the East when it comes to approaching uh, in uh, regulating the private and public sector within the space industry. So, sorry, can you repeat the last? The main differences in approaching uh, the regulation of the public and private sector between the East and the West when it comes to the space sector? Uh, again, it's a hard question to answer because West and East is a... We have Eastern countries who follow Western models of policy and uh, economy such as uh, South Korea and Japan. Um, I would say the, the main differences are probably on how much we allow for commercial entities to exist by themselves and not so much being controlled by uh, state actors and not being strictly governed by national interests. And do you feel that um, still space is very much politically driven, even in, in this uh, uh, private sector-led developments for the past uh, few decades? Well, it's a yes and no answer here. So definitely space will be driven, is driven, will be driven by political uh, ideas, visions, interests. So government understands that the space sector and space companies have something to offer which fosters, for example, socioeconomic development or help them with disaster management or national security. And we will also see a drive by commercial entities for their self-interest to make money <laughs> or to provide certain activities that they'd like to see uh, realized. It's a mixture of both. It is a challenge to get them together in some cases. And since we are uh, talking here also about risks, it's a challenge to find a set of regulations that fits everyone. Um, I just want to add here, I think there's a bit of a misconception sometimes in the industry that government puts so many regulations against them. Uh, yes. There are a lot of regulations that you will have to follow. However, government has to think more than just the commercial industry. Uh, they have a responsibility to their people, their safety and security. They have to make sure uh, uh, that the environment is protected in, in space and on Earth. And so, yeah, there's a lot of discussion going on. It is a very interesting thing, and I'm happy to discuss details in person, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Brian, do you feel that um, militarization of the space industry uh, is reducing opportunities for the private sector or do you feel that it's enabling them? So I, I'm certainly of the opinion that it's an enabling factor. Um, uh, when, uh, you know, I think uh, there can be a misconstruence of the, the meaning of the militarization of space. Certainly the military has been a part of the space mission since its inception. Uh, uh, depending on how your interpretation of history 
uh, is, I mean, is Sputnik could be looked at as a, a military satellite, as, as all the follow-ups both from the United States or several of the follow-ups from both the United States and the, the, the uh, then Soviet Union. Um, so I, I don't see it as a new phenomenon, and I certainly don't see it a, as a, a stop to commercialization. Um, the military remains, both in the United States and in other countries, one of the main uh, customers for commercial space, and I don't see that coming to an end anytime soon. Um, now, uh, kind of going to one of the points that, that uh, um, Dr. Vidmar was talking about uh, before he cut off, uh, is the military, whether it be the Space Force or some other form, ultimately going to become a policing force uh, in space? Uh, I, I think it's an interesting question in that, uh, I mean, we're really talking about two things when we talk about the regulation of space. Thing number one being, what does the law say? What are the norms that are going to be established in space? And the second, how, how do you enforce those norms? Uh, my personal opinion is that we're still very much in the process of establishing what the norms are and what they should be in the first place, and I, I don't see us being in a position to answer the second question quite yet. Um, uh, whether or not the, the quote-unquote militarization of space will be a part of that answer, though, I think is an interesting question. Thank you. Dr. Vidma, we've got you back. Yes, apologies for that. That's it's not... one of those, you know, it never happened before. Um, I'm, I'm in my <laughs> office. You know, we are allegedly sitting on top of UK's most, both cyber secure as well as uh, lowest latency, um, you know, research network. And yet, um, it completely disappeared there for a second. Uh, but I think the discussion has moved on in a, in a, in a direction that I was kind of very interested to explore with the, the fascinating colleagues from around the world that we have here, which is this idea that, you know, at a stage where we, you know, really are getting, you know, a, you know, the states are going a little bit hands off from from commercial actors and, you know, down the line potentially individual actors basically uh, doing things in space autonomously. Then, then these questions will need to be explored. And if we talk about the risk, is perhaps the area where we need to be clearer um, than we have been in the past as to what are the scope, what are the key concerns and what is the scope for both states as well as international organizations to actually um, both set the rules as well as intervene if those rules are um, breached or, or one way or another sort of challenged. And Dr. Colucci, how, how, do, you, how do you feel that intervention may be, may be possible? If there are rules set in place and there, there are players out there, role players breaking them. How those rules shall be enforced? <clears throat> well, you know, the this is this is a little bit of crystal ball, but uh, I think what will eventually need to have happen is, as the West developed alliance systems to deal with aggressive states on Earth, and those alliance systems would be such as NATO, ANZUS the defense pact with Japan and South Korea, that that will need to be extended into space. And, and, and maybe when history is written 100 years from now, people will point maybe to the Artemis Accords as one of the first uh, layers of that foundation as, as that became something to, to take the Western ideas about how to develop space uh, into space. But, but I think probably one of the areas of greatest controversy for those of us involved in this issue of combining technology and futurism and politics and military and commercialization is, is the debate between those people who think that space will somehow be a sanctuary, and they, that, that term, of course, is the term used, for um, all of the problems of mankind will simply cease to exist in outer space. Um, th there's simply no evidence for that. I mean, there's, there's no history of that. There's no, there's no concept of even that, ha that, that, that has that. So, so I think that we, we are best when we are realistic about the projection of power into space as, as we talk about the projection of power in the world. 
And so it will be up to the Western nations and, 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 and it is correct, right? To, to when we say the West, we're not just talking about in geographic terms, uh, to create those norms. Those who wish to follow those norms, that's fine. Those who wish to break those norms will face the problems that they face today. Whether, whether, whether that's the, the Syrian state today or the previous Libyan state, whatever that is, th those states will then con uh, occur uh, whatever consequence there is. And those consequences will have to be fairly severe. If I may just do a little reply to that, because I think on, on yeah. one hand, I completely agree that, you know, the, 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 the it's a fantasy to think that space is in any way different from anything that's happening here on Earth. And the, 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 what we are seeing already, and we will see further into the future, is that we export behaviors and norms and the way we govern relationships. The good, but even more so the bad, as, as people travel and, and explore quote unquote, you know, new, uh, you know, territories and barren land. And we've been, we've, an experience we've had in the not so recent history over the past 300 years, you know, shows that, you know, the, the project of nation states in particular, but then also private actors expanding territorially has led to enormous suffering and has exported really some of the worst practices um, across across certain parts of the world. So we have to be absolutely very careful and we, we shouldn't have any un, under any illusion that people will somehow start behaving differently just because they're not tied to the gravity of this particular planet. Um, having said that, I, I would still hope that there's a little bit more of a dialogue between the different sort of systems of, of thought in terms of the way we think about things like property, the way we think about things like, you know, ownership, the way we think about things about governing relationships, um, where we can, I think, be a little bit more exclu inclusive. And I, whilst on one hand, I understand exactly from where Professor Colucci is coming from in terms of, you know, there's, there's, there's a, you know, the, the currently, the current model, sort of United Nations governed model is effectively a reflection of the West, the norms of the Western democracy. I think we have to be just a little bit careful to say, well, you know, uh, you know, that has generated a bit of tension as much as it has also settled certain previous tensions. So how do we make sure that, you know, that is, that is also looked into as we develop this seemingly extension of a regime that we apply here on Earth into, into new spaces. Are there things that we could actually historically do better? Um, and can we actually apply that as we redefine these relationships in space? Because it is relatively a nascent area and, and we have the, still have a small window of time when we can actually be exploratory and we can take on board views from around the world as well. But on the other hand, we also need to be mindful of the security we need to be mindful of, of, of the critical issues we have in the, in the world right now so we don't just go, go into this blindly or indeed naively thinking that somehow space is the solution to the problem because it isn't. So would uh, those private sector representatives then be simply excluded from participating in this new world of uh, open space trade if they happen to fall within the governance of those so-called bad players, as uh, Dr. Colucci. Uh, mm. they no. <laughs> uh, so, how to answer this question properly? First of all, there will always be a, an attempt by commercial industry to influence what states are doing, and states can transport that to the international arena and to discussions. Second of all, in international dialogues, industry representatives are often invited to talk about their experience, about their activities, because you, can't, you can only properly regulate, create agreements, if you understand what you want to regulate, what you wanna, uh, where you want to, to what you want to develop an agreement. So no, I also don't see commercial space actors as uh, per se, uh, evil. Uh, that would be uh, a misperception. What I'd like to say is that commercial industry actually could be a driver for international cooperation and collaboration if done well. And one of these things that, has, that I already mentioned with space traffic management 
it is in the interest of the commercial industry to have a system, that's my opinion, uh, to have a system that regulates what is done in space because the more things we send up, especially in mega constellations, uh, the more critical it gets to find ways to avoid collisions, to avoid space debris creation, which then hurts commercial industry. So for commercial industry, it is an interest to have a space traffic management regime in place. And they can go to the governments and say, come on, get together with other governments and find a way to do that. And there have been already attempts to do that uh, with several networks that have been created. And there are organizations like the Space Data Association in which uh, government entities and industry work together to improve the exchange of information on uh, space data um, to improve the operations in space. So yeah, uh, to sum it up, commercial space industry has to play a role, should play a role, and will play a role. And if I could actually add to that discussion just just for a moment, I, I would I would contend certainly that um, you know, state actors and the creation of further treaty regimes and international agreements are certainly going to have their their place in the system. And the Artemis Accords, I think, is an excellent example of that showing some promise. That being said, though, I, I would argue that it is in fact going to ultimately be the commercial actors themselves that are going to be one of the major drivers uh, of uh, this international understanding of what the norms in space should be. Um, as the name implies, a, a norm in space is by definition what is the expected um, uh, 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 actions by actors in space. What, what, what do we expect them to do? Well, until actors are actually doing those things, it's very difficult to make those sorts of predictions. So I think it's going to be uh, largely the commercial actors going out and actually doing things that are going to set those expectations. So, and, and that, go, so that goes beyond just communication with state actors. This is what we want, though there's certainly a place for that. And we've seen recent success with that, with companies who say, want to mine the moon or want to mine asteroids going to uh, 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 states like the United States or, or Luxembourg or others and saying, hey, we, we need some sort of uh, legal recognition of our rights to these, uh, to these space resources. And we've seen some success there. But I think it goes beyond that to not just saying, hey, legislative body or state, we want you to establish this. I think it's going to be the actors themselves going into space acting in a certain manner so that states can use that as a template to when you know different actions take place to say no this is improper because we've already established that this is the the right way of doing things. may i say something to that uh while this could happen i hope it won't uh i i understand <laughs> that uh commercial entities have a certain interest uh to do that, what you just explained. But I am still a fan of getting the states together because states have broader responsibilities. I mean, it is not a perfect comparison, but an unregulated internet <laughs> and social networks governed by commercial entities in the beginning has not created the best of outcomes in all cases. So, and now governments try to rein certain things in. I'm not against what you said, necessarily. I would like to see a more state-based approach, if possible. Sorry. I mean, and if I can, just, just very, very briefly, I think that we have a lot of reason to think that actually space industry has the potential to do that, to be in that kind of really good place where actually the, both the states and in the, in the co corporate actors come together because probably the place where um, commercial interests are currently the most present and most active, which is geostationary orbit, is extremely well regulated, right? I mean, there's probably obvious problems with those as well, 
but there's an international telecommunication union who's sort of overseeing the, the band uh, and 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 um, slot allocation. It is it is it is an is an agreement that works between both work, uh, um, member states as well as commercial actors. There's trading going on as well between states in terms of orbital slots and stuff like that. So so actually, I think that the 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 the, the problem we're having is that um, unlike um, a geostationary orbit, where I think from very early on, the strategic importance has been defined so that both the commercial and the state actors have had direct kind of um, a, a pressure to actually go and get involved early. I think with low Earth orbit, which is really what a lot of the discussion here has been talking about in terms of particularly the space traffic management regime, though that we, have, we kind of have two cases. We have the mining for resources or resource extraction, which is deep space and Artemis and all that. And then we have low Earth orbit, mega constellations, and just the fact that loads of stuff is up there and how they actually manage the, the influx of, in, of the number of satellites and other objects that are flying around. Um, but in both of those cases, I think the question really is, you know, is equal pressure on the commercial actors and the states to get their act together and then come up with a solution that works for both? And the answer so far is really no, because on low Earth orbit, the commercial interest is far outpacing what the state is really kind of keen to provide. And in in, in the deep space is almost the other way around. I mean, the states are kind of getting very, very touchy about like, you know, particularly with the current space exploration because, you know, sites are being sent towards Mars. People start saying, well, if you go that far, you know, you'll, you're bound to leave some stuff behind. And, and then the, the problems about all these kind of in-situ in resources become a big thing. But the commercial case isn't there really for a vast majority, as much as space mining sounds cool, the commercial actual finances aren't in place and the case isn't really there. So, so I think there's a question at which point these two, do, these two things come together. And, and again, the question perhaps for everybody here is how do we make a case that, that, you know, that balanced, balances things out, uh, particularly for low Earth orbit, particularly the colleagues here who work with, with, uh, with, with uh, you know, Air Force and, 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 and US government or the other governments, you know, how do we, how do we make the, the threat apparent in low Earth orbit so that, that you know, space traffic management is, is, is something that rises on top of the agenda. Uh, if you want to do I, I don't want to add too much to the discussion because I agree with much what has been said. I just want to make a clarification. The ITU has its limitations and they are mainly doing uh, when it comes to uh, setting the positions of or settling uh, on who, which company is allowed to set which satellite into geostationary orbit. Uh, the near-Earth orbit is not necessarily what ITU is doing, except for... Um, of course not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, geostation, I mean, so geostation is where uh, in initially, right, the big satellite, you know, the big interest, commercial interest was pitched. And then, of course, there's the, the, the middle orbits, which are, you know, which are, you know, gray zone. Uh, there's still banned, there's still some banned rights that are well regulated, but there's a lot of stuff that isn't well regulated. But I agree, yeah. there's loads of limitations. I'm not saying ITU is the answer. I'm just saying that once the industry and state interest align in terms of how important they consider something, solutions are found relatively quickly and are relatively well implemented. The problem is where one outpaces the other, where either there seems to be some kind of governmental desire for regulation that doesn't really have, uh, that isn't really, have, isn't really based on any actual commercial concern. Or on the other hand, there's a lot of commercial concern, but the government is not realizing what the potential challenges of that are. And I think the question is just like how, how do these things get balanced and relatively quickly, particularly in case of low Earth orbit. And if I could add uh, just one thought, I think you hit the, the nail on the head. Um, uh, it, my comment and my uh, contention, I, I think, is based on the idea that um, with, with the exception of perhaps national security interests, and, and Dr. Colucci is in a better position than, than even I to, to sort of speak to that, but w with the exception of that, I would argue that the, the state interest is in uh, or should be largely focused on the commercial interest. So, who, and who's in the best position to decide what that interest is, is, is actually the commercial actors. So by them actually showing and making what their interests are, making that known and making that understood, 
I think that's what's going to drive the, the regulation. Where you have a situation where the regulation is trying to drive the commercialization as, as opposed to the opposite, I think that's where we're going to, to find stagnation. Just to reverse the question a bit, um, Dr. Colucci, do you feel that commercialization has uh, created greater challenges to risk management in space? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's inevitable that, that we will see certain commercial actors <clears throat> potentially behaving badly. Um, in, you know, when we look at this, when we look at this issue, you know, I think we have to remember a few things that eventually there's going to be a conflict between one commercial actor and another commercial actor. We're very much focused on the state and the commercial actor, but there's another element to that, right? There's going to be, there's going to be some event, whether it, maybe it's a mining operation, you have two commercial entities that are claiming rights over it. Who knows? It doesn't really matter the scenario, but but there will be conflict between two commercial actors who may or may not be members of the same state or subject to the, uh, of the laws of that state. Then you're going to have a conflict between a commercial entity and a non-state actor that's not a commercial actor, whether that's a criminal enterprise or a terrorist organization or a space pirate or whatever scenario you want to envision. Then there's going to be the, the problem between a commercial actor and a state actor. And so, you, you know, you can mix and match all of this. So, so in order to avoid the darker aspects of what that could end up being, and, and there, there could be some very dark ones, you're going to have to rely on some type of rules-based system, which those, uh, I, frankly, I'm hoping, of course, that the United States leads that effort with its Western allies. Because, because and, and again, I've talked about this in other, in other uh, venues, you know, the United States government, you know, and those of us who have some consulting, we looked at many different scenarios and, and we've actually come up with eight of them, eight, eight scenarios looking out to 2060. And of the eight scenarios that, that we've looked out to 2060, three are really bad. <laughs> They're really bad. Three are really good and two are so-so. And, and, and if you look at those three, three really bad ones, and it's all publicly available, um, it, it's, it's this vacuum created by the West, which allows for these bad things to happen. So commercial entities that really are interested in, in this new economic revolution that, that's going to be so fascinating, really should also be interested in ensuring that the good guys are up there first and first presence. And, and, and that, that has to be a marriage between commercial entities that want to be responsible and governments that want to be responsible. May I add something? <laughs> Go ahead. I don't think the West has always acted as a good guy. So that's just added to that. Uh, I mean, I hope that we lead certain aspects, but coming back to what has been said earlier, I'd also like to see more dialogue between Western countries and also China and Russia, etc because they will be present and it's better to have them included than excluded uh, because as long as you talk, but, but you don't but, fight. Yeah. L let me add to that then. Yeah. So, so I think the problem with many people in the space community uh, that I've witnessed is they like to try to compartmentalize space. Space somehow is this other thing and, we, and they forget that, that you know, geopolitics, astropolitics, international relations, international economics are a web. So, so to suggest that uh, Chinese state actions and Russian state actions, just to use those two, are going to somehow be benevolent, even though they're not benevolent in any way, shape, or form on Earth, uh, is a fantasy. So yes, we can dialogue with the, with the Chinese, and we can dialogue with the Russians who just pulled out of NATO uh, engagement this morning. Um, or we can live in the real world and understand that, yes, the good guys represented by the West, the United States as the leader there, uh, will, will hopefully dominate, or the other side will. And, and no dialogue will protect us from that. How do we avoid the same errors that we have been repeating for, for centuries here on Earth when it comes to our fight for resources? 
then. You know, we, we hope to be the first, but then what happens if we're not? And I, by we, I yeah. refer to the West. Then do, do, we, do we request for those resources to be shared, or do we, do we make our way in and appear as the bullies in the, in the equation? What is the, what is the approach for that you know, greater, greater humanitarian good in, in space? Well, I think uh, to use one example, it'll, be, it'll, it'll probably be like the way the United States Navy protects the, uh, all the oceans of the sea, regardless of what state is using them. Uh, there, there is simply, otherwise you'd have a, a, an ocean travel that is dominated by, again, criminality, piracy, terrorism, uh, bad state actors. And so, it, because we, we don't want that, the U.S. Navy acts as that guardian force as much as it can. And that, I think, will be exactly the model for space, where the United States, primarily and its Western allies, will act as that guardian force in if initially cislunar space, will probably be the majority focus for, for our lifetime and maybe even the next generation. We'll see what happens with technology and possibly on to Mars. Uh, and, and that is the great model, right? That is the model. It doesn't mean the United States and its allies are everywhere. It doesn't mean we're planting the flag everywhere. It certainly doesn't mean that U.S. and Western companies get to do anything they want, but it allows an order system to be created to allow for that commercialization to exist with free choice and the protection of contracts and private property. Christopher? <sighs> <laughs> uh, I, I hope... We fully we disagree on that. <laughs> the two of us don't <laughs> get together in this now. Uh, uh, because I consider this a quite nationalist approach and hegemonism. And I really don't think that the US is the... I mean, I'm really, really happy that we are under the protection of the US here in the West, honestly. Uh, I also think we got a lot of good out of the US. I just don't see the US as a benevolent dictator for space. And I don't want them to be there. Uh, as such, I think we need for space to have dialogue and international agreements as much as possible. I am a realist in the way that I understand that we might not achieve this in every aspect, uh, especially when it comes to militarization, that is a reality. But when it comes to commercial activities, I really don't want the US to dominate what we can do and not do. And I, the, if you ever want to read a book, that at least puts shivers down my spine about an approach on how to govern space. That's by Professor Dolman, Astropolitics, uh, who promotes a more or less uh, US-controlled access to space. Um, the, I mean, we agree to disagree on certain aspects on how <laughs> space should be governed. I leave it at that, because otherwise we go into a geopolitics discussion here. <laughs> I would say, however, that, you know, in defense of Everett Dolman, uh, Everett, Everett's contention is not only, not, not U.S. access to space. His, con his primary contention is that liberal democratic values need to be the values explored into space. That's his primary thesis. Not that U.S. needs to dominate space, but he recognizes that as the leading democratic actor, the United States will, of course, lead that. But his primary thesis is <coughs> that liberal democratic values need to dominate space. And if I could add to, to that discussion, I, I think it, it, this is a, an excellent illustration of what I hope the future of space looks like. And I, and I think that this is a good forum to bring this up because of the international audience of this particular conference, in that um, while states do and will continue to play an absolutely vital role in, in the future of space, I'm hoping that it can be an international venture. And in, in my very much, you know, US centric Western based way of thinking, and I, and I, I recognize that bias, um, my opinion is, is that the, the most utilitarian way of achieving that is, is through commercial markets. Um, do I think that the United States should necessarily have primary control over that? Do I think that China or Russia should have primary control of that. No, I don't. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, actors trying to create value uh, from space, where, in my opinion, so much value exists, 
uh, should be the, the means of, of achieving that. And whereas I personally believe that uh, the West has a, a, an obligation to try to make that possible, um, uh, I, I think that it's the, the commercial actors, the actual people in space that uh, I hope will, will really have the reins in that process. Thank you. That was beautiful. Uh, and with that, we've come to the end of our panel, but uh, I would like to invite the audience uh, to address questions to our panelists. Uh, we've got Daniel there at the back, please. Good morning. Thanks for this discussion. Uh, linked to what been talking, you've been talking for the past 20 minutes, uh, what's your view on um, um, how commercial entities can try new protocols, new laws, and new um, legislations uh, in the establishment of collaborations of, uh, between satellites to leverage and use resources, for example, use of downlink, use of um, storage capacity between satellites, not, um, uh, not developed by the same company. Anyone can I like to take that one? I, I think I don't fully understand the question, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but if maybe one of my colleagues on, uh, has an idea, please. Can you quickly repeat the question, Daniel, please? Absolutely. So, uh, we, 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 we saw that we are missing regulations and some laws in space and uh, also to um, yeah, reduce risk manage I mean, management. And, um, so, what's your view? Uh, if you want to establish collaborations between satellites developed by different entities, uh, for example, in the usage of uh, downlink uh, for, for example, during disasters, there are satellites that are saturated, so we may use data from nearby satellites, uh, and therefore we need to establish regulations on how we can use additional uh, data. Or storage capacity, for example, again, uh, in disasters, uh, during disasters. What's your view of what can be done and how can commercial entities help in shaping these new regulations? So, so I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to answer this because I think I'm, I'm, I'm starting to get, get an inkling for this, but I think the question here is between, you know, are we trying to say, is there kind of a voluntary regime that the commercial entities can come up together to create consortia, or are we talking about sort of regulation, some kind of an imposed, you know, if there's a natural disaster, you have to share and, and we'll effectively police you to share, to be able to, to actually to share. Um, I think on the, on the collaboration, a lot of that already exists. I mean, we've, we've actually seen uh, this in, in the search for the Malaysian airliner. Uh, we've seen this in, in, um, in the tsunami response. We've seen this in many places at, at different times where uh, resources were relatively freely shared amongst different uh, nation states or other assets of different nation states, as well as assets of different private companies regulated in different nation states, and you know as, as far wide as you know from 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 far east effectively to 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 you know the west and and all and then everything in between. So I think from that point of view, when disasters strike, actually we often see the best in humanity and things kind of magically happen overnight that otherwise aren't possible. Um, in terms of actually pushing a regulation through that would mandate this. Um, you know, that, that is a much problem, more problematic issue, particularly if there's effectively costs involved, which somebody will have to foot at the end of the day. However, and you know, this is, you know, we are speaking about this, you know, two weeks ahead of COP. I think we will have to look at sustainable development framework in ways in which we, you know, a proportion resources in terms of, if you like, space intelligence, you know, the, the, the information we can get from space for common public good because, you know, a disaster somewhere on the other side of the world is a shared disaster because it is, you know, the, the, the climate is, the effects of climate are changed uh, and interlinked as well as the economic impacts of that are being borne out across the globe. So we'll need to think about a better way in which that's brought together as a shared resource. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that there is actually some progress on that uh, because there is a part of COP that's looking at the way that actually uh, the sustainable development goals and the climate goals in particular are being monitored and how that information is shared, which is the main way in which sort of satellites can play a role there. 
let's hope that something comes up from Glasgow in, in the next two weeks. Uh, but of course, the question as always is, is who's going to pay the bill, right? Are we actually able to equitably split the cost if we're sharing resource, resources? And of course, that doesn't necessarily mean everyone has to pay exactly the same amount, but it means probably that, you know, we have to understand what are our responsibilities and, and how can we come up with something that's also economically sustainable? Because somebody has to build these things, maintain them, put them up there, all those things. And I think that, that, that brings up two interesting points. The, the first being the, the ongoing discussion in space of what, what is the responsibility to, to share? Uh, is, is there a requirement, and, and I think if we uh, attach it to commercial space becomes especially important, is there a responsibility for actors who are able to do things in the space to provide resources, whether it be uh, downlink resources or information or, or remote sensing or it, it, it deeper out into space, whether it be uh, minerals or whatever it happens to be. Is there a responsibility for those who are able to access those first to provide uh, stuff to those who do not yet have that, that capability? This is an ongoing international discussion. Uh, I, I won't suggest any, any answers <laughs> in, in this forum, but I, I think it's a, a very interesting question. Uh, but the second uh, interesting point that uh, your question brings up, I think, is the, the additional complication that comes when multiple actors are using the same equipment or the same uh, uh, utility. Where on the commercialization side of things, I think that's absolutely necessary and absolutely a good thing. But for those of us who are working uh, with and for the state. It certainly introduces complications for things like uh, a common thing you'll hear about is the dual dual use equipment. And so if a conflict were to break out, like say it's, uh, I mean, let's use the most commonly cited actors. Let's say it's the United States and China. And let's say China is gaining access to uh, uh, information that, that we see as harmful to, to national security. Well, if that information is coming from a satellite that's also sharing information or being used by multiple actors from multiple different states, what is the ability to respond in that sort of situation? Again, it's a long discussion, so I won't try to get into answers right now, but I think it's an interesting question that gets introduced by this, this very good idea and is an illustration of the, there's not always a, a straightforward answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and we've got one virtual question as well before we wrap up that session. Hi. Uh, so we have a question from Julian Timmers. Uh, seeing that the commercial sector is new to the industry and large organizations such as NASA and the ECA would have sent the criteria and guidelines, wouldn't you be implementing a greater risk management seeing it's open to the commercial sector? Would like to take that one? Well, yeah. I'd just like to make a small clarification. I mean, the industry has always been there. I think it's just it changes the mode of business. And, and yes, there are some new actors who are, who are kind of, because of the change in nature of business, there's a, an entrepreneurial space is opening up and more startups can join and things like that. But actually, the industry has always been there. NASA hasn't built anything, right? NASA, NASA's rockets and, and, and payloads and satellites and space station equipment and, of course, landers and everything has been built by industry, by big um, American uh, contractors, like you know, names like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and all the rest of them, you know, other providers that are available. So, um, they, so from that point of view, the big industry has always had a say. I think the really interesting question there, in terms of regulation, comes in, well, when it's not under contract to NASA, when it is something that is effectively done by the industry for their own, you know, and, and, their, and their client isn't a state actor, like a European Space Agency, NASA, or any other thing, um, but is, a, is, is, you know, is another private company, or even it, it, in some cases a private individual, then, then who is guaranteeing that that's a sensible use, that that's a sensible technology to be deployed in a particular way that they want to deploy, it, right? And at the moment, that burden is on the launching state and partially also on the, on the state who's actually involved in the production of, or manufacture of the, whatever this is, is it a launch system or a, or a payload. Um, but the, 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 the regulation there is already, you know, the burden is the state needs to check upon something. It's not setting the parameters as to how something's been built or how something's going to be launched, but it's checking upon other people's due diligence. And of course it creates an opacity 
that needs to be filled with regulation. And this is really where the, 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 all the discussion we've had today sort of starts from, is the idea that this opacity needs to be spelled out if we are to have kind of an, a kind of an open access to space and we can start talking about possible competition on this on this subject. Um, but I think with risk, which is both to security potentially, but perhaps more importantly, there is there's a kind of there's a there's a greater sort of risk to um, to to eat to end into conflict and to end into sort of technical difficulties in space which have which hamper other people's access, I think that's really where the kind of the careful positioning of regulation and enforcement need to sort of be worked out. So it's a very too much too long, way too long an answer. Please, other <laughs> people, there's some more. Well, that was a fantastic panel. Thank you very much for joining us. A round of applause for our panel.